Well, thanks very much. I'm very happy to be here. And this is with Jay Hong and Giuseppe Joan. And this is closely related to what we just saw. Closely, well, close related. So we know that this is, this is a sign of the times, inequality. And there is a large body of literature that says that there's a lot of inequality out there. In the boring things that the econom economies care, which are earnings, income, wealth, there's a lot of that, and it's getting larger. But we also know of large socioeconomic gradients in health outcomes and in mortality. We've documented some of that, but also in many other health outcomes that have been <coughs> documented. And what we want to do today is to relate the inequality in health outcomes to the economic inequality that we are more used to be thinking of. And what we do here is we're going to build measures of inequality between socioeconomic groups. We're going to use the notion of compensated variation, which amounts to saying how much money would they have to give you so that you are indifferent between who you are and somebody else. But we're going to do it in a special way by taking into account that the, what makes people different are not only differences in consumption, but also differences in mortality and differences in health. And we're going to see that these two things are not the same. And we're going to get the first attack to see what actions can be taken by different groups of people, in particular by the disadvantaged groups, in improving their health and mortality outcomes when given more resources. So we're going to say, we're going to say, is there, when I give more consumption to some groups, can some of that translate into lower mortality and better health outcomes? Is there a way to get at that technology? By the way, that's one of the big mysteries in social science, I think, is that does money translate into longer lives or better lives? What is how much can you buy? So that's what we're trying to get after. But in doing so, in trying to attempt to do this thing, we do something else. We're going to estimate how preference vary with health directly. And we're going to tackle this thing of health improving technology with medical expenditures. How much of that can be bought? So this is a long project that first we're going to have a, a model of consumption and health choices we're going to estimate such a model with over-identifying restrictions. We're going to use those estimates to do welfare analysis, compare <coughs> the fate of different groups given their allocations, and we could ask what different groups would do if their resources were different, and how much would their welfare change. Not only, so the, the, the key thing that matters is, is that if you give more resources to some people, they can choose it efficiently in order to achieve what they like most. We're going to see how much of that can happen. But today, we're going to fail slightly short of that. We're going to discuss, I'm going to discuss briefly how to compare welfare given allocations. We're going to write and calibrate a simple model of consumption and health choices that has the property that we can understand identification from a simple set of statistics. And you can see which part of the data that's the talking and giving us the answers that we want. I'm going to talk about the estimation of a big quantitative model that doesn't make the heroic extreme assumptions that this one makes and, it, and it's facing in a more realistic way with, uh, with what the problems are. And it has a bunch of more realistic features, but this part is still preliminary and our estimates are not settled for, because of a couple of te hard technical problems that I'll try to share with you if you misbehave. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll enjoy some time telling you this very boring part at the end. Okay? Okay. So let's talk about the compensated variation. So imagine there are two groups. <coughs> and I think of college dropouts and college graduates. So this is a complement to the previous paper. <laughs> Look at the rest of the people, <laughs> the high school graduates. So, so they look at the middle, we're going to chop off the middle for most of it. We're going to think of the college dropouts, sorry, the high school dropouts, or if you're politically correct, the, those that do not have high school, for not necessarily because they drop out, 
10, and then college graduates. Okay, those occasionally put a number of the high schoolers, but let's look at these two extremes. So if they have the same preferences, and I'm going to just write them in, in a static context, then to make them equally happy, you have to make their consumption equal. So a measure of how much more screwed up the, college, the high school dropouts are than the college graduates is to compare directly the consumption. If this group, if they, so essentially you solve this for CD by making it equal to the consumption of college, so a measure of inequality is the rate of consumption. But if they have different longevities, we have to use a utility function that includes consumption at the value of expected longevity. That's exactly what we saw before, what's the value of life. There are some measures out there of the value of life that we're going to use off the shelf. But if anything, they make life a little bit cheap. Part of the reason they make life a little bit cheap is that they're based on the choices made by groups of people who seem to value life less than others. Why is that? Because there are some jobs, some occupations that are riskier than others and you use them by things like the wage premium of those occupations. Now most people you know would not use those occupations, would not be crab, king crab fishermen in the Aleutinian Islands, <laughs> will not be firemen in certain contexts, so think of this, the value of life, if anything, it's understated in here, okay? But once you put the value of life, then the to compare, when you're saying how much would a dropout have to be to be e accept her fate as relative to a college graduate, you're not going to give her the longevity of the college graduate because the longevity is associated to who she is. So you're going to give the consumption, extra consumption, to perhaps make up for the fact that longevity of the dropout is lower than longevity of the college graduate. Now, but this is not enough. Everybody that has had a hangover, a headache, broken arm, knows that life is better when you're healthier than when you're not. <laughs> okay, so the numbers on self-assessed health gives you a better life. So if we Try to get a measure of how healthy you are, and that's part of what we do, is measure how much happiness is being healthy gives you. The compensated variation that you have to give, this measure of how bad it is to be a dropout, by saying how much consumption would you have to give them, so have the same utils as a college graduate, will have to make up not only for the differences in duration of life, but for the fact for the empirical fact that of those years that they have left, college graduates spend a much higher fraction of the time healthy than high school dropouts. So there are two things you have to overrun. Your poor are going to consume less. That's what we all think. That's economic inequality from the beginning. But what we bring to the table is take into account that college, the high school dropouts live shorter and worse lives, both. Okay, and if we estimate preference that health maintenance technology won't compensate people, then we will get a smaller number because this number that we get from this exercise will mean that the, these people have no control over the duration of their health. We want to estimate somehow how much control could be out there. And we're going to say if there is some, chances are that they will use some of the extra money that, they would, that we would give them to spend it into improving their health and life duration. And then that means that we'll have to give them less to equate this thing. So we're going to try to come up with numbers to give us a sense, okay? So after this introduction, let's talk about how do you, we construct the utility function. How we construct this problem to come up with this. So the simplest model that we can use is a lunacy model, where there is perpetual old, so you could perhaps never die, but survival, and, which means that survival and health transitions are age independent. Okay, think of this, and there are complete markets 
That means you can insure yourself against living too long. Just here, this model calls for death insurance markets, not for life insurance markets, because what you want to do is get paid in case you survive, because you want to create consumption across the rest of your life, but also stay contingent health, because that your health may change your assessment of consumption. So in this simple world, which will not be the world at the end of the paper, <laughs> this is just to, for that you see how it works, there are complete markets for both being alive <coughs> and your health level, and you're going to live forever, <laughs> And you're going to choose how to allocate your resources between consumption, medical consumption, and savings. Medical consumption is useless in terms of happiness, it's not. So think of this as pure investment. So it's not that they have a better looking doctor, so he'll make me happier when I'm sick in the hospital. No, I'm not buying that. I'm not buying a more comfortable bed. All I'm buying is a better outcome in the future. That's what we're th going to think of it. I'm choosing is how much money to spend in things I like directly, how much money I'm going to spend <laughs> in things that we're going to assume are only good to improve your outlook. Could you, I, I couldn't quite get why, uh, or why the non-medical, why is the consumption have to be regulated? We're regu we're regulated. There's no regulators no, in here. We increase the consumption component. In, in, in poor people to make them comparable to uh, I don't income. Do you mean you didn't understand this, two, the difference between these two? Is that your question? Um, so which part didn't you understand? Why do you have, when you're trying to compare the two groups, the lower income and higher income, you said you have to uh, corrugate, uh, cor uh, correct for the poor people's low consumption, so you added more consumption. No, no, that's not what I said. That's not what I said. So this is the thing. One way of thinking of the outcomes is that there's nothing that one can do about your health outcomes or your life duration. Okay, this is what point three three does. But that is, as that lady there was complaining <laughs> energetically before, uh, we'll say it again. Yism. I always try to not say the names even if I know them because I, dis <laughs> because I destroy them. <laughs> you know, I destroy them when I say them. But, but Yism, okay. So here is assuming that, that there is no control. And number four, we're going to say, let's see if we can estimate a technology where out-of-pocket exp out expenditures can be used not as, some, as a bill that is sent you from bad health, but as a form of effective investment. And if that investment improves your health outcomes, then the, the total result will be that the compensation will have to be smaller because the amount of money you have to give them will change their behavior in ways to increase utility. This is intermediate micro. But that's highly dependent on the, um, on the Being highly dependent. It depends. <laughs> all depend on <laughs> this oh, depend on height. This we have to estimate the technology. Once I come with the technology, I'll tell you how it depends. Highly or lowly. But we'll come up with an estimate that says how much action is in that play. Question is how can you come up with that? And that's one of the hardest problems. You'll see that when we get there. Okay, so we work. So the choices no medical versus medical consumption. Sir, are you going to allow this transfer to be possibly negative? What? Are you allowing for competitive advantages? Are you taking into account that some dropouts may actually earn more than that college? Parents? Now this is going to be very simple putting bins. So, so this is only be two types. There's only going to be two types. This, this is a very simple thing. Just don't don't look for hard problems. This is just a very simple calculation. You see it in a second. So what is a type? Types will differ in resources and the initial health. So think of the way exactly Bob described it before. People have self-assessed health, who turns out to be a fantastically accurate uh, tool to forecast the evolution of health. So if you look at people at 50, they're going to have different amount of wealth. <coughs> they have different initial health. 
think of this is for each type E is for education. This is the fractions of each type that has equal certain health level. They're going to also differ in how the health evolves by type. And we know this, we know the, uh, the realized things are very type dependent. This is something we know. We, as we have estimated before, not estimated, it's just calculated directly that the evolution of health is very much education dependent. And we're going to propose at some point a technology that says the evolution into good health is intermediated by how much you invest. This is what the, where the money may help if you spend it in healthcare. One thing we discovered, and this is an empirical fact, is that conditional on your self-assessed health, your two-year survival is independent of your education. College educated people, that means what? That means essentially the things that kill you fast have no role, are not different across education groups after 50. Those are essentially two things. Super nasty diseases like pancreatic cancer and violence. Accidents, murders, those things do not seem to differ by education groups after 50. So there's no E here. There is education affects how your health evolves and how was the initial health. And then we're going to post a utility function <laughs> that has this property. Notice then there is a constant that makes valuable for living exactly the B that Palm had and a marginal utility. That both of them, alpha H and xi H, will affect how, how people assess health. The alphas tell you how much you value to be alive. They also tell you how much you, life to, to, you value to be healthy. And the chi H is telling us how much more we value consumption in different states of the world. In other words, do you want to, the money to go on vacation, something that you need good health for, or do you want the money to enjoy a good looking doctor so he smiles at you or a nice comfortable bed or whatever it is? And we're going to estimate that. So we're going to estimate these two things. Okay, and we're going to again aggregate health into two groups like he did. The dynamic programming problem associated to this is, is very simple. Type doesn't change. You have wealth and health. And you're choosing how much to invest in your health, how much to consume, and how much, which portfolio of, say, contingent claims you're buying to maximize expected utility, and you have a budget constraint. The nice thing about posing the model like this are the interest rate is just the, the rate of time preference, and the prices of these continuing claims are equal to the realized evolution of health levels, <coughs> something that we can get straight from the data. And the standard complete market result is that this, the ratio of the parameters that determine marginal utility come from the ratio of the consumptions in each health level. So we have direct estimates of this. I mean, you can just get them off. We don't even have to do any econometrics. Just put this ratio by this ratio, and we get these two ratios. <laughs> and the consumption will be today and tomorrow will be constant. Yes, this is an implication from stationarity. Okay, and then the optimal health investment, which is tell us something about how much is X useful, tells us marginal utility of consumption, which is what you could do with the money if you, if you eat it, has to be equal to what you do with the money if you spend it in healthcare. And what's that? That's the gain in, survi in survival and in health outcome of the residual value of being alive. Did you not say survival doesn't, oh, it doesn't depend on E. Doesn't depend on E. So, but it depends on, but you can change. It depends on H, but here, the way the timing is such that there is not an elastic term because the timing is such that, survival, that your expense now changes your health tomorrow and survival depends on your health today. Right. And that makes it cleaner. 
Okay, and the nice thing about this is this it's all a little bit of a formula. And then conditional value is just given by given the parameters, you can, yeah, this is just your applier formula. And the welfare comparison then can be done two ways. The one I was having number three, the one I said, let's put the survival constant, all we're doing is have to solve for how much extra consumption do you have to give them to <laughs> conditional on the other outcomes. But if you allow them to, to, to be chosen optimally, then you have to do it in a different way. That gives a very nice way of solving the different ways of calculating the compensation variation. So how do we inform this with data? <laughs> well, the HRS, which is a US data set that tracks people over 50, and is very concerned about making sure who's dead and who's lazy in terms of answering, so it keeps track of the mortality rates are very good. And it also has the health distribution by age and the health transitions and the survival function. And that gives us the initial distribution of health, <coughs> the realized health transitions, that's the notion there is an X star, what they actually chose that translates into different outcomes and the survival probabilities. From the PSID, we get the consumptions by age, health, and education type and the out-of-pocket medical expenditures that right off the bat tell us by comparing the rate of consumption in those healthy beings with the consumption in the healthy beings tell us that the ratio of marginal utilities is 85%. So people value the money when they are healthy, not they are unhealthy. That's when it's more important. That's already telling us a lot. To obtain the health technology parameters, that, that, that thing that is trickier, well, well, that's what we're going to get from this later. Then, from the standard data and clinical analysis, we, we get outside estimates of the value of statistical life. What he was talking <coughs> was between two and, and nine million dollars on a flow basis is around 300,000 or 400,000 per year. <laughs> but there is a lovely thing which, that we do, well, lovely, I think it's good. We combine a Canadian data set with a US data set. Canadian data set asks people how do they value different conditions? What is the cost of being, having a bunch of different problems? And we use the HRS to impute a combination of those conditions to each health level. And from that, we have the absolute levels of utility between good and bad health that allow us to solve for this alpha component. So these two things, and the kinds that we've got allow us to obtain the alphas. So let's look at the findings. Well, at age 50, some of the stuff has already happened. The college graduates are in better health than high school dropouts. In fact, that, so this is some of the numbers that are related to the ones we saw before. By age 50, 94% 90, of the college graduates, they feel to be in good health well, only 60% of the high school dropout. So the bad things have, have already happened, yep? Why are we looking at education as a way of stratifying people? Well, the nice thing, it does, oh, I don't, I don't, you may have a theory of race, which I don't. Mm -hmm. I have what? <laughs> it's also it's a joke. A theory of race is a tricky thing. I know, but we're not, we don't have a theory of education. The thing is nice, this education. is 50. So this is because it's at age 50, this, that thing doesn't change anymore. I don't want to use I race. Know. I don't want to use race. You don't want I don't, know what it, I don't know what it means. But what does education mean here? We're not it means, doing it either. Oh, I know what it means. Okay. Whether you have 12 years or less, less than 12 years of education, so I have no. Does this show up here in, does it show up in your income? No, it shows up in who you are. But your race also shows up in who so you are. So you say. <laughs> which, which race you think I am? <laughs> <laughs> I've, I mean, I'm having all kinds of trouble with my children, because I tell them that I'm African. <laughs> and he doesn't approve of that. And it, depending on where and when and how, I would qualify. Not all the, not under all rules, but on some. <laughs> so I don't want to use race. That's the long. That's the. That's the long one. Okay. So. So I said these guys are already sick at age fifty. 
and their lives differ in survival. So, for the, for the years that we were looking at, the, the college graduates were conditioned making making 250, had a life expectancy of 83. Then, sorry, this is wrong. Conditional being always in good health, you have a life expectancy of 83. This is some 15, 20 years ago on average. You're always on bad health is 19. So you can see that's part of the things that Pong was talking about translates into what are the conditional probabilities of survival. This is a gamma age in here. But the key thing is college health transitions are better. They are better at remaining in good health meaning they have a 6% lower probability of transition <coughs> to bad health, but most importantly, they have a much larger probability of recovering the good health. And this means you put all these numbers together, and this translates into not only a longer life horizon for the college, but a higher fraction of the time spent in good health. So I don't want to do that. This is the, the Canadian data that we use to get the health quality scoring. And then just something about that previous fact you showed, the uh, transition probabilities. Yep. I mean, it, it is, so are you going to estimate the technology based We're going to do that. No, but this is, this other, this is the, the, these are the ones, the realized ones. All I'm reporting now are the realized ones. I'm going to get the, get the estimates later. But the estimates are going to use these really I'm going to use that and other things. Another thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This but is not enough to identify. Right. Right. But even here, um, I mean, we know that, say, rich people all their lives have eaten better. Uh, maybe the kind of bad health that they have is different from... That's fine. You see, whatever. We want to say how much is the X and how much is the the super index in here. Okay. That's what you want to learn. Is there anything to be bought, or is it something that's already there, nothing to do about? So we don't want to assume either extreme. You want to be able to tell. OK. So as I said, to, to impute, this is just a, I don't want to get into details, but, but these guys ask people about a variety of conditions, how important was to be healthy relative to those. Vision, hearing, speech, ambulation, dexterity, emotion, cognition, <coughs> pain, etc. What we did is we used the values associated to each of these and we imputed an average to each health level, the, we imputed a certain score on this. And that allows us to say how much the health is valuable. All the same weight? All? All the same weight for each of these? They put dollars. So what you do, we use in dollars to do that, and then you use the range of those things to try to do the calculation. So that's the, some, I'm sure some of them are worth, I don't know, the, I don't remember the details, some of them are worth more than others, and some of them vary more than others, and those two things enter into the calculation. So if a score of one reflects perfect health, <coughs> and a score of zero reflects death, that means a score of 75, what the, the, in the units that it is, means that a person pref values four years under the current health equal to three years in perfect health. That's the units that you have. Okay? <laughs> and we use this data. Okay. So what, what do we find? We find that there are scores that there is certainly, of course, a higher score when you're healthy, but that, that's the limit. So it's not 0, 1, it's 0 0.85 and 0 0.6. This is how bad health translates into a score of 0.6, so that, yeah? Just one question, so in these measures, usually you can get a negative minus, you, you can have a negative value of life, no? As well as in your model. There's no value of life. This is not a negative value of life. This is about what is the... But I mean, the scale is between zero and one. Yeah. And usually the score can be negative. In this, uh, well, not the score we constructed, so it's between zero and one. So, so I don't know what you just saw the mean. Okay. Because You're I mean, saying there is... There is a way of interpreting these findings that translate into killing yourself as an optimal outcome. Well, because yeah, you use usually time trade-off stuff, and usually you can end up with negative. Uh, that, well, that may be. I don't know the details of that. Yeah. We use it about. We use it. I mean, this is the part I know the least about. So we use it to try to okay, to so make the best possible outcome to one and to zero, and then translate it into tr trade-offs that you want to substitute, okay. and those where these units tra translate into time being good versus bad. 
Okay. So that means that um, <coughs> using these numbers, this is the type of relation that you get. The utility, if you have perfect health H, the utility of consuming the certain amount gives you 85 and the other one gives you 0.6. That's the, what it translates into. And that gives us a, a very nice, simple way where to solve for the parameter. So this is just, given this finding, give us a way to parameterize the economy. So right now, going to, we're going to give you, is I'm going to use only this utility function I have computed and say, okay, how bad is to be a high school dropout relative to a college graduate? Okay, so let me show this to you. So consumption while in good health of the college graduates is 40,000, is 23,000 for a high school dropout, which means 75%. If you are an economist only, one of those that are not in this room, but the rest, that will be the measure of inequality. They will say 75% is the difference, is how much consumption would the high school dropouts after 75 need to have an equal deal than the college graduate. It doesn't say anything about whether they, how they got there or not, have nothing to say about that. It's about how much better do they seem to live between after 50, well, 75% extra consumption. But it turns out the college graduates expect to live 31 more years, and the high school dropouts only 25, difference of almost six years. This is the high schooler in between. But of those years, College graduates expect to spend most of them feeling healthy, while high school dropouts only about 60%. So they have a, going to live longer and healthier, a bigger time. So, to see. So you do a measure of compensated variation. Well, this is just using the first one, ignoring all kinds of health. So this is you have to give. If we know all kinds of health, you say, I gave dropout 75% extra consumption, they will take it and they will accept who they are better than, than college graduates. But if you take into account the difference in the quantity of life alone, that number goes to 6.4. That means you have to give them five times extra, five times their current consumption, 5.4 times their current consumption to have an equal deal that the college graduates. If you only take into account life duration, if you only take into account quality of life, but not life duration, <coughs> the amount goes to 5.6. <coughs> if you take into account both, it's 25 times, meaning 24 times. That's what I said before. <laughs> Differences in health are enormous. They dwarf differences in consumption as allocating differences in the deal people get in life. So this is under any measure that I can come up an enormous number. So income inequality is a stupid thing to look at. <laughs> this is where the action is. This is what makes some people so much better than others. So you have to give them 25? 24. They have one. 24 times. So does that mean that like, the marginal utility consumption assumptions are going to become important? If you're going to increase the number to such an extent... It's, so equal, ut it's equal utility. Remember, we've got equal utility. So, so this is taking into account that you, you get a bonus for being alive. That was the alpha H is how much you want to be alive per se. How much mm -hmm. you... And then, so you... Oh, but you fact you have law that enters in there somewhere. Yep. Condition on the lock bit. Like if you, if you, you change... The, the, the assumption of using log somehow becomes... No, it doesn't matter that much because if you have a different, uh, let's say more curvature, he uses three. If you use two, the alphas and the ages will change, but they will recover the same facts, which is that 0, 6 versus 0, 0.8 and the radio but of else that. Is change, basically. Uh, yeah, yeah, it will change accordingly. Change. It may make the number larger. <laughs> Because my, I think it would be slightly larger because you have to give them more money to make up for things that they don't have. That, I guess it would be larger. Okay? 
but we didn't want to, to get to, to put it into that. Excuse me. Yep. There's a leisure thing over here in utility because like in the data, um, like high school dropouts, for example, mm -hmm. or below college, they get more, um, they, they, they have, there's a le leisure inequality where they, the dropouts, they're doing better with leisure. As well I as think like. two things. One, that's baloney. <laughs> And two is, no, we haven't done it. Let me tell you what I think is baloney. That uh, one of the things that we do badly as economists is to treat time as either work where you slave or leisure when you enjoy life. If you think of any notion of career, any notion of, of reward on your job, any notion of something that is fun to do, you know, my job beats being a construction worker any day. So just because I put four more hours on a construction worker doesn't mean that the enjoyment of my allocation of time is worse. That's what I mean by baloney. I wouldn't use a lot of that given, given the fundamental different type of jobs and, and uh, amenities associated to each occupation. Yeah, but their retirement comes earlier as well. That's not, that's not peanuts, right? They uh, I'm, compa I'm comparing the consumption here. So you incorporate so you incorporate the drop in consumption that would arise because they retire earlier. The glue, these dropouts must retire on average much younger than the white. Well, because they die also much younger, yeah. So they have an increase in leisure, so maybe not at the margin, but at the extensive <coughs> margin. No, it, it wasn't just leisure, like, because they retire early. It was because no, 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 same, because there are two things. They retire early and they work fewer hours. Yeah. But I'm saying, but that's because you're thinking of utility of working zero, utility of not working a lot. I'm saying if you think of any notion of, of job amenities, dropouts are not doing so great. That's, that's what I mean. That one may be some in there. The dif I don't think the differences are that large, but we'll have to look into that what, to see what they are. Whatever it is, 25 it ain't. <laughs> no, 25 it ain't. That's not, that's not key less. Am I going to give you one? Is that <coughs> an extra list of worth year, one yearly consumption? I'll bet you not even half. And I will move it from 24 to 23 and a oh, half. It's, like it's not worth my time to deal with this pettiness. Two percent of the, I'll give it to you. No, okay. I'll give you twice as much if you want. I right, I wrong, That's what I'm saying. I'm saying, uh, no, this is you. I'm trying to say it jokingly, but I think it's this, whatever it is, and even if it's slight, it's too hard to Okay? Because it's... So... <laughs> The welfare difference due to, to quality and quantity of life are so huge. White low tires do not give up consumption to buy better health. It says, can you buy that? If it's so big what you get, can you buy that? Well, it must be that out-of-pocket health spending is not that useful in improving health at age 50. Might be. So let's try to see how much it is. So one thing you could say is that some economists are now pushing the line the people are stupid and they don't know what they're doing and all they need to be told is spend more on this and you'll do better. That's not what we're going to do here. We're going to follow a line of rebuild preference. So let's look at this. I'm going to pose this technology that says the transition for education, depends on your education, is an intrinsic advantage that you may have plus some technology and money. So it can be, the thing it can be that uh, lambda one is zero, saying money can buy nothing is what you're <laughs> saying, it's just an advantage of the types associated to education are there. Or it can be that this is irrelevant, we are all equal, and it's just some guys are spending more than that. So the question is how can we tell? When, when, how can we tell? When I, when I work on this, I don't like to know the answer from the beginning. I mean, if that, why would I bother saying it in economics when I can say it in English? And I can increase my volume as a way of being more right. But we want to, we want to see how can we tell. Well, this, as I said, this form is flexible because it can blame it on either one or the other. Okay, but there are eight parameters, which is the curvature, the decrease in returns to investment, the units for, and this is one for the persistence of balance, we say this is a persistent process, as we've seen before, and they might be different by education. So eight parameters. 
So in an exactly identified world, you need eight equations. Well, the first one are the four first order conditions for investment. There is one for each education type and one for each health level. And it is like that. Fortunately, conditional on parameters, we know these numbers. We observe this. We observe that, so we have the only unknowns are the parameters, because the rest are numbers. But we also have the health spend. This is just that the first of the condition has to be satisfied. The other one that we see are the ratio of health spending across education groups compared to the ratio of consumption by education group. That tells us something about how, what the curvature is. This, what the curvature is. <laughs> And that has to be true for both good and bad. So those are two more. And then the health spending level identities, which is the right hand side of, which is means equals the real asset. So we have this in the data. So the parameters have to be such that, that once we put the x's, the observer x's, they have to satisfy this equation. <laughs> so those are two. The first of the conditions are behaving optimally. And, the, and what this revealed. So let's look at this. If we, we look at that, they're consuming, think of the logic, they're consuming 75% more, yet they're getting a much worse deal in terms of life. So they should somehow, if this new and this lambda, and this lambda one were not too low, they should be spending a lot more. The, the, the uneducated guys, why? because they have a lot to gain from doing that, okay? But what do we know? Well, from other studies, the out-of-pocket money matters little after age 50. It's confirmed, so of those 5.6, you only get the 0.3 can be bought. And this is what our estimates are <coughs> saying. And, and it's, it is uh, consistent with a bunch of studies that have used some random or quasi-random variation, like the lottery in Oregon, and this, you know, Raquel would know this better, the, the health insurance experiments, says, you know, this way of allocating money doesn't seem to buy that much. Which means that we recover a small curvature, which means the rate of return, the additional money is buying very little, and that's what it's explaining from that. Did you say that the Oregon Medicaid Extension Lottery of 2008, that it did not increase um, No, what it said is that, no, what it said is that it showed there was little value of out-of-money spending. That's my second-hand reading. I, I wouldn't know that a lot better, but it didn't say that those that got the deal did a lot better than those that didn't. That's the, as I understand, was a finding, I think. People that know this have found, have found that better. So. But in the data health share, the, but see there is, the income elasticity is, of health spending is larger, but the shares are similar. So, so what the, the way to, to rationalize this is that the curvature is low, the value, for the, the value of health is high for the uneducated people, the shares are similar, and that translates, that's what makes the three things consistent. And that ends up meaning that they are very small lambda ones and lambda ones, which is how expenditures with this curvature translate into marginal additions of life duration and of, sorry, of good health survival. Okay, remember, if spending money was very useful, people would spend more than 18%, given how much they seem to value being healthy or alive. Okay, so now. <coughs> Really? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> really? And you sold it as well. No, 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 no. There are two things. 23 is the value of not being a dropout. What it is is how much do you value being healthy relative to unhealthy. So it's 0 0.8, 0 0.85 relative to 0 0.6. And that is telling you how much would you pay for having perfect vision, for not being shaken. Plus, you are a young lady. You know nothing about being unhealthy yet. <laughs> but this, this would take it more for those that have been there than that. 
Okay, you can't imagine how it is to be really sick yet. So you, you want to get that from more uh, experts in the field, as you would say. <laughs> okay. Okay, so these are the parameters, mean the, the parameters by themselves, they don't mean much. But now, we can, this is a restatement of the numbers before, they're slightly different because we have computed total consumption differently between uh, ex excluding the, before consumption included healthcare, consumption here is excluded, but, but it's 0.75 was before, now it's 0.6, it was 25, now it's 20. But so what happens then when you allow people to, even though it doesn't pay a lot, remember it doesn't pay a lot to health technology doesn't seem to be enough. If you were to give them money to poor people, you don't have to give them 20 times, you only have to give them six times. Why is that? Because they would spend more in health. They would optimally reallocate <coughs> some of that extra money from consumption to health, mm -hmm. and they would achieve somewhat slightly longer and healthier lives. But still, <coughs> the differences in the lifetime utility or in the residual lifetime utility with a college graduate is still enormous, it's six times more consumption. So I'm saying, yes, redistribute. you can redistribute some, and they will reduce from 20 to six, but they're still, they got a very bad deal from before, being from there. Can I ask a general question? Yeah. I mean, if you want to understand this health production function, yes. and by the time they're 50, it's probably too late to change a lot of the bad things that have accumulated in their health. And we know that early on there's a lot of bad consumption. Uh, obesity is very related to, I, I bet your dropouts are much more obese and eaten much more you know, bad stuff over the years. So doesn't that, I mean, I want to believe that the health production function could be a little better than what I think making. you're wrong. Really? I, I enjoy saying you're wrong. What do you mean I think you're wrong? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, telling, I'm gonna tell you what I mean, I think you're wrong. No, no, you're out, no, it, no, no, it's not. In the following, so I think you are wrong, is that if you were right in many things, then two years survival <coughs> would be informed by education, conditional on your health, but it's not. So you, you consider yourself an age, your health equal to any level from one to five, a, a dropout person that gets the same number than you has the same two years survival. Yeah, but there's some very bad shots. I no, I said, about but two years, conditional on two years, you have no advantage whatsoever, Con conditional on your health relative to a dropout. The, the thing are the things that move slowly, and those are more in command of your actions, whatever the actions may be. So say maybe, maybe you're saying the lambda zero, whatever the constant was in here, whatever, you know, the lambda zero was in the... This one, this thing that gives you the absolute mm -hmm. advantage. Maybe that can be changed. Some of us, we have nothing to say about that. That may be. So, but the actual, we try to, to do, we try to use for a while measures of suffering. I want to tell you, non-smoking, eating vegetables, getting the flu shot, none of that was there. Partly because you do that when you're already sick. So we couldn't find any statistical significance in those, except for <coughs> prostate cancer for men, certain tests of, and some other cervical cancer for women who seem to be unforecastable in other ways, but that was very tiny. Okay, so let me, yeah, so this is still a very large difference. But these are numbers, 10 minutes, so these are numbers like are only estimated with a little bit lightheartedly. We're just getting it from ratios, assuming complete markets infinitely live, then you want to be um, more careful and more thorough and estimated. So you want to have a quantitative model that doesn't take those extreme assumptions. Like you <coughs> have life cycle in complete markets. But what's the problem? Once you get into that, this model, the way I've been talking, is you spend more, you have a better outcome. But you know, that's not true. <coughs> you spend more because you're sick. <laughs> so no matter how much you feel, spending more is a f predictor of bad outcomes. So you have to combine the persistence of good health 
with the fact that money on average predicts disaster. Okay, and predict disaster in an unobserved way. I don't know when people are sick. I see them after two years, you get your level, and then something happens, and you spend money on that. So how do you do that? Well, across types, higher spending leads to better health transitions. We compare college to non-college. We see the college guys spend more money than the non-college guys. But in a panel dimension, that's not true. You spend your, your twin brother starts spending money, you know, he's sick, it's going to get worse. So how can you tease this out? What we have, the way we have modeled it so far, is a health outlook shock, it's an unobserved health outlook shock, that changes the, retail, the return to health investment and the probability of health outcomes. But of course, we don't see them. So well, there also need another shock for consistency to generate a reliable sets of errors for the model, but let me not be worried with you with this. Are you saying that if you have cancer, it's a waste of money? No, I'm not saying that. You, uh, I'm saying that if money, no, I'm saying exactly the opposite. I'm saying that <coughs> your health today and the money that you spend in the next two years cannot be sufficient to predict your health two years from now. Because my twin brother and I have equally health today. And I'll spend more money because I got sick in the middle. And the I got sick has to be something that worsens my outlook and the money will only, will only reduce that outcome. So it has to, of course I'm going to optimally choose the chemo as I have done. It was not that expensive. But the, what I'm trying to say is that the, you have to make sense of the data in a particular way. And we know that college guys spend more and they do better, but individual people spend more and do worse. How can that be? It's because something happens that triggers that. And that's what we are doing in here. We have this health outlook shock <coughs> that is an observed to the econometrician that comes and induces you to spend. Okay. Or is it just because the uneducated, the high school dropout, didn't know where to spend that health money, whereas the college-educated person knows where to put that extra money to improve outcomes? Well, can I go on a little twist? Especially in the U.S., right? I mean, there's a huge differences with the, the type of health plans and feature you have access to as opposed to the college dropout. So, so say that again, say that again, say that again. So it's easy as a... Say that again, say that again. I, I didn't understand you. Do you mind repeating it? Yeah. So the, the, the opportunity, right, and the your rate of return of what you would get on your health spending, right, is highly correlated with your education. And, so you, know this, right and you know this exactly how? Well, if you, if you are... No, how do you know this? How do you know this? How do I know this? Well, yes. welfare state studies on health insurance in the United States. I mean, there are plenty of books about it. <laughs> Jack of Hacker, you know, 101. Um, that's, so, I will not call a reliable source of information in those. Well. But what I, what I want to say, you, so let, let's say, let's say, let, let's, let's come here. Let's try to go come back to the, I think this will be better seen here. <coughs> this is a technology, okay? Remember, what you're saying is that, I think what he's saying, is that perhaps we should have a different E here. Mm -hmm. That's what you're saying. That the dollar spent by these guys translates better into health outcomes than this. Is that what you're saying? No, we'll shape more the, their preferences when you're filling these questionnaires. Right, like when you do your, your panel data, right, and you do your thing on health, and so of course the way you value this health, or how you will position yourself and how you respond to surveys is directly dependent on the type of health so insurance you that, are access you telling me? Access. Are you telling me then, you're telling me something different in, <coughs> in the context of this model. You're saying, you're saying that these things should be an education in here? <coughs> that you're saying that people are different and educated guys like to be healthy more than uneducated guys? That's, no, what they, that's where the only place where we got the service to determine this. 
No, we we'll see we we'll have an incidence on the type of job they will get. And then they have an incidence of the type no, of... That's already of translate, that already translates in the health that they have at age 50. So for mm -hmm. sure, there's a lifelong career of events that have happened mm -hmm. that have changed how you feel at 50. So what we're doing here is saying, okay, what can we do? And, and one thing that I'm very happy to, to try to explore is that would be there a way to come up with that. And that's what we're trying to explore now. And we are getting all kinds of troubles in different forms to, to, to get a, a tight measurement of that. And we'll tell you when we find out. Okay, but I want to translate into, into how to do that. That saying, I want to translate that is saying, which I think, let me translate it into less partisan ways. Clearly, college educated guys have an advantage. And there are three possible sources of advantages. Let's, let's ignore this curvature here. One of them is that they're better built in the notion of whatever you have, better habits, something that you don't have to worry about, it just better goes with you. The other one could be that they are better at cashing on expenditures. They are better at once they spend money, I, that translates into better outcomes. Perhaps they read better, they, they use the drugs at the right time, they forget them, they forget them less, that might be here. The third one is may get better price. I think logically those are the ones that I can think of. I don't know whether you thought of that, and that's, those two are we, are some we're trying to worry about. They get better prices, which means they get more action per X, or they're better cashing those expenditures into, into outcomes. Let's see. <laughs> So I say you need to, to have this thing where bad thing happens and makes you spend more to make sense of the patterns of the data. Now the model gets a lot harder because you have to index people by education, age, health, and wealth. And the household is choosing how much to consume, how much to invest, the, whether they get sick or not, and how much they end up paying for it. That's, uh, and We'll, we'll have a bunch of first order conditions. Let me give you a feeling for them. It says it's a first order condition between consumption today and tomorrow. This can be in estimated independently because we observe the realized transitions. Because to say the realized transitions, all we need is consumption today and consumption tomorrow. And we essentially recover this way the gamma that we had before. And the other one, the health investment, this is nastier because they, rec they require the whole value function. They require that you completely obtain the residual value of the, li of the life. So how do you do that? Well, you can do that the Ayatollah way by estimating the whole thing full Monty, which we're not going to do that. We're going to do slightly cheating and, trans and aggregating people into beans by using wealth quintiles and then the state space become, it becomes a few hundred equations and unknowns. But the utility function keeps having this shape. Now we're going to let marginal utility of consumption to vary with age, meaning the value of consumption probably may be decreasing as you get older. You care more about how the smiles of the doctor and less about skiing in the Alps type of thing. That's, and then <coughs> we have the health transition that still it doesn't have what you want, doesn't have the different allocation on the return to location technology. And then you need a bunch of other things to estimate that. That allows you to estimate without solving the model, just using the implied, the implied allocations to compute the realized value functions conditional on parameters. And there are two types of parameters. Parameters on preference that can be estimated only from the other equation can be estimated at the first stage and the parameters of the health technology that require imputing the rest. Okay, so let me tell you the problem to do this is that we don't, we observe neither the etas nor the epsilons. So we don't know what this solar equation of people are doing. So you have to use 
place an update in France and econometrician to impute for this unobserved So let me finish, I'm going to do that. So I'll finish two ways. We see that two things I want to show you. We have no time, so let me, let me not talk about the problem. Let me tell you two things that we have found that are important in here. The first one, there is a tradition among essentially conservatives that the dropouts had it coming. They are dropouts because they're impatient. They went to party when the good guys went studying. That's where they're about. And that can only be made sense of because of impatient. One thing we can do is we can estimate patience rates, discount rates by <coughs> education level, and they are constant. If anything, they move the wrong way. So poor people have high, lower consumption growth rates because they're going to die, and they're going to get unhealthy, not because they're impatient. This is what our estimates are telling us. OK? The other thing that we are finding is that, and that with that I finish, is that, yeah, as time passes, the value of, uh, the value of, this, I don't know if this, I, I don't want to say that because I may be <coughs> confused now. For the rest, we still have preliminary outcomes. I don't, want to, I, don't want, I don't have to do that about how the technology works. We're having all kinds of trouble uh, accounting for the fact that at the <coughs> same time, expenditures don't predict, don't predict the outcomes very well, but the wealth groups, richer people do better. And that is hard to make sense of that we're trying to have. Okay, that's what I wanted to say. So. Thank you. Okay.